Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the latest webinar by MBF Bioscience. I'm Sue Tappan, staff scientist here at MBF. I also run the day-to-day -day operations at our contract research stereology facility, MBF Labs. Today, we're going to do a live question and answer show. I've used this format once before, and the response was very positive. So this time, we're going to do it again, focused on questions related to histology preparation. This webinar is going to be dictated by the questions that you ask, either at the time that you registered or during the next hour or so. These questions can range from how can I minimize shrinkage to what do I do when I lose a section. I'll do my best to answer as many of them on the fly as we can. We've had a wonderful response to this webinar. You are logged on with over 100. Right now, it's 109 fellow stereology enthusiasts. So I'm certain this is going to be a lively discussion. So get comfortable. And let's get started. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to view later. A link to the webinar will be sent to you in an email. If you'd like a certificate for completion for attending this webinar, please let us know in the question window and we'll provide one to you. All questions and answers will be available on our website, even if I don't have time to answer each one live. So please send me your questions at any time. I'm going to start with a brief introduction about the impact of histology on stereology experiments and then open it up to your questions. Design-based stereology is the process of obtaining unbiased, meaningful, quantitative estimates of three-dimensional properties from two-dimensional information. It makes no assumptions of size, shape, orientation, or distribution. The sampling is performed on a subfraction of your entire region, and that means that only some of the sections that display your region of interest will be analyzed. And of those sections, a fraction of the region of interest on each section will be quantified. This systematic sampling is highly efficient and provides sampling consistency across and within sections. A randomized offset provided by the software, like Stereo Investigator, ensures unbiased measures. Stereology does have a number of prerequisites that must be considered prior to starting your experiment. The most important of which is that each object must have an equal opportunity to be sampled. Simply put, if you can't see it, you can't count it. And so there are two aspects that really matter, where you look, so you need to use the whole anatomic region, and how you look. So some combination of your probe and your tissue must be isotropic, and you're going to use a unique point to recognize the object of interest. An experiment first starts off with a hypothesis. With your question in mind, you also need to consider how you're going to observe and quantify the effect, the operational definition. With a stereology experiment, however, how you quantify depends in no small measure on how you prepare your tissue. Thus, each of these three concepts must be designed with each other in mind. It's obvious that how you prepare your tissue can impact this idea that each object must have an equal opportunity to be sampled. We're going to focus today on strategies to help you overcome roadblocks to optimizing your histology. So paramount is the histology preparation. If you're new to stereology, then it's likely that you're going to need to change a few habits when you're preparing your tissue. Stereology does not require gorgeous photomicrograph ready tissue. Necessarily, it's always good if you've got it. But it does require that your entire region of interest has the possibility of being sampled, and that includes complete staining through the entire section thickness. The techniques that you have previously used to obtain great material for photos will not necessarily aid you for stereology. The advice that I will try to share with you today is not intended to be gospel. Rather, you know that staining is an art. It's not to say that the staining protocol that you're currently using can't be used for stereology. You don't necessarily have to rewrite the book. Maybe we just need to employ some thoughtful editing to the process. Histology has a little bit of black magic to it. It's kind of like cooking. You may follow your grandmother's recipe for biscuits to the letter. Yours may be perfectly delicious, and yet never achieve that same quality that evokes grandma. With histology for stereology, it's not quite that esoteric. We are looking for a few key qualities. How can we see our region boundaries? How can we see our region of object, uh, object of interest? And how can we do as little work as possible? Let me repeat that to do as little work as possible. Often the first step on this path is a stereology probe that utilizes thick tissue. The thicker the better. But as you know, that can be easier said than done. So today, we'll try to tackle this head on. 
So let's open up this forum now. Let's discuss the very aspects of histology that are causing stress to see if we can give you some options to try. Perhaps you're struggling with transitioning to staining thick tissue and you've got a dead zone or you've got damaged sections. Any question is a good one. Just send them on to me. On that note, the key to a successful webinar today is your questions. So let's go over how to send them to me. The GoToWebinar control panel, panel is visible on your monitor along with my presentation here. It will automatically close to the upper right hand corner of your screen during the presentation. To submit questions to me, simply click the orange arrow button to open up the GoToWebinar control panel. Find the question tool panel, type a question in the box, and click send. I'll take your question text and paste it onto a post-it sticky that will remain visible. In order for me to parse the vast amount of info that I'm expecting that will be coming at me, my colleague Kristen Connors is here to help me out. It would be helpful if you submit each question that you have separately rather than asking three to five questions in the same message. So let's bring up that post-it and get started on the first question of the day. So let me delete this placeholder text and replace it with a question that's been submitted. How about this question from Hamza? Our first question is, what is the recommended thickness for staining for stereology in your experience? It's a good question to start off on. We'll get, we'll get the juices flowing here. Work out the little kinks, get, get loose. So um, in short, the thickness that is required for stereology depends on your stereologic probe that you're looking to use. So if you are using a probe to count object number like the optical fractionator, thick tissue is best. However, if you're using the Cavalieri or the area fraction fractionator, those probes work on a single plane of focus, and so those probes can be done on any thickness, especially thin tissue. And so the recommended thickness for staining when you're talking about thick sections um, is, is complicated because I would say the thicker, thicker is better because um, when you have thick tissue where the staining penetrates the entire section thickness, your um, application of the optical fractionator probe is efficient um, or more efficient. So I would say if you can obtain about 20 microns or so, more is better, of completely stained section thickness, um, after processing, that would be great. Some people can do that by cutting 30 microns, others cut at 60. So what you cut the tissue at is not necessarily what you'll obtain after you're done sectioning. So let me see if I have a section that, that deals with this. So this actually leads right into a question that has just been posted. And I'm going to address this one in combination with the one that we're talking about now. So, you know, uh, what do you recommend for a section thickness? And uh, the question that just came in is, I understand that thickness, thicker is better, but does that thickness affect the quality? And, and the answer is sure. Um, you need to balance the section cut thickness with the staining protocol and the requirements of the stereology probe. And that needs to meet this minimum criteria that your section um, antibody or your antibody penetrates the entire section thickness. If you get a dead zone where the antibody does not stain the middle of your section, then this material is too thick. Let's uh, check to see how you can determine whether or not your thickness is acceptable. So to evaluate section thickness um, in the middle of counting, you can see the impact of where you're placing markers by looking at the z-depth histogram here. Okay, so, so when you're counting, if you look at the z-depth histogram by looking at your data, you can see that when the tissue is um, thick, you'll see that um, cell tops in this case, because we're counting objects, neurons in this case, um, this tissue, the, 
maximal depth that a cell top was placed was at 24 and a half microns. Um, whereas another animal from the same study had um, had a, a great deal of shrinkage where you see that, yes, the maximally measured section thickness is greater than 24 microns, but you can see that the vast majority of markers were not placed anywhere near that. This long tail to the right indicates that it's variable. So this, this um, square-shaped histogram indicates that the section thicknesses are, are uniform across sites, and then um, the, the x-axis will let you know how thick the, the sections are. Once you have a good uh, understanding of how thick your tissue is, so you might have cut it 40 microns and it shrank to 12, or you might have cut it 50 and it shrank to 10. That happens. So we need to talk about how you can reduce your shrinkage. So if you have um, antibody penetration all the way through that section thickness, but it shrank to uh, too small a value, uh, let's first deal with how to deal with tissue shrinkage. To retain the most tissue thickness, um, the, before you change everything in your protocol, the first things that you can do is minimize the exposure to air and alcohol. These happen at steps that you don't actually write down in your protocol. You don't write in your protocol, go to lunch, leave my sections on the slide on the bench top. Or maybe you do. If you do, you, have, you know that that's part of your protocol, stop it. So if you limit your exposure to air, you're going to limit some of that collapse that happens in that section thickness. You can also consider using an aqueous mounting media. So alcohol, as you know, is drying, um, which causes shrinkage. So if your protocol can permit it, maybe you can use an aqueous mounting medium and just avoid those alcohol steps or minimize them. So maybe you need the alcohol to really clear the tissue just a little bit. Maybe you don't need to run a whole dehydration series to take it to DPX or something like that. Uh, finally, maybe maybe it's appropriate to consider fluorescent staining instead. So um, if you had planned to do your study in Brightfield, but you're really not obtaining thick tissue no matter what you try, maybe you can try doing your stereology study with fluorescent staining instead. Because it's primarily an aqueous situation for fluorescent staining protocols, you have less shrinkage. Another way to... Um, limit shrinkage is to limit the amount of time that these sections are exposed to air. One way to do that is to use free-floating um, protocols for your immunohistochemistry. And in this case, you can collect the sections serially into a multi-well plate and then roll a dice to determine what interval to stain. Um, and so in this case, you would select um, this fourth, fourth series of every sixth section here to um, be a part of your optical fractionator study. And you would select these sections to stain free floating during your experiment. OK, so let's take another couple of questions here. It looks like we want some more information on how to determine how much your tissue has shrunk. So let's, um, let me give you a couple of suggestions. OK, so. Um, this is one of the questions that came in. In Stereo Investigator, you can determine how much your tissue has shrunk by just bringing it to your scope. So after you're done staining, um, you know what the tissue was cut at. And so you're going to uh, put your specimen on the slide, um, bring the region of interest that you're looking to quantify under view, optimize your uh, light path. So if you're using Brightfield, perform Kohler. Make sure you're at a high objective. So um, 100x would be fantastic uh, because that's the um, recommended magnification for counting. And so once you are there, you've got your tissue under view, you can do what's called a set stage Z. I don't have a, a microscope um, attached to this version of Stereo Investigator. I'm in an office, so I can't uh, show you this exactly. But you would select set stage Z at the top of the tissue and then focus all the way through the tissue until it goes out of focus and then you come right back in until the first thing comes into focus 
And then the value that's reported in the Z meter here is your section thickness. Okay, the optical fractionator workflow and step five also has a really handy tool to allow you to take multiple measurements across different areas of your uh, section to see how variable the section thickness is as well. So I hope that helps answer that question. All right, so let's move on to another common issue when you, when you transition to cutting thick sections. Um, there's a lot of questions that are very similar to the question that was just submitted here, which is how can we be sure that the antibody reaches the whole section? So I've already suggested that you stain your tissue pre-floating so that you're limiting the exposure to, to air during the steps when you're changing solutions. The other advantage of that is that you don't have to worry about the sections falling off during your washes either. Staining pre-floating is really helpful, mainly for that reason. Uh, as well as this antibody penetrance issue. So let me go to a section dealing with what to do with thick sections and optimizing your histology for that. So uh, we call it the dead zone. And this is an XZ projection through an image stack, that sh the one that I have up in Staring Investigator right now. And you can see that it's nice and bright at the top and bottom of the tissue but then it gets really murky and, and foggy in the middle to the point that you can't explicitly identify objects anymore. You may see that there's some faint staining in there, but it's really difficult to see what's going on. To help you address this, I recommend uh, always using a counter stain because uh, a stain like DAPI doesn't have, it's not an antibody, so it's gonna penetrate the entire section thickness. So you can help use that as a, a positive control for you so that you can see just that it's the antibody itself that's, that's not making it all the way through the section thickness. In addition, it's important to realize that not every antibody is going to behave the same way. So in this particular case, um, green is TH and red is nu N and um, they both have a little bit of penetrance issues here, but uh, it, it appears that the red seems to penetrate better. And so you need to optimize your histology for, for each um, antibody. You can either do that separately or you can do it together, but just make sure that you pay attention to every channel that you're going to quantify if you're doing fluorescence. So what does full antibody penetration look like? If you were to count a, an animal where there was no difficulty with the antibody penetration, you'll see that you'll find cell tops all the way through your histogram. They're gonna vary, but you can see it's a pretty square histogram here. In contrast, if you have a loss of staining in the center, you are no longer able to identify those cell tops in that chunk here. And so what that means is that you're no longer meeting that criteria that's necessary for stereology, which is that each object has an equal opportunity to be counted once and only once. So to summarize, probes that utilize thick tissue require that the staining penetrates the entire section thickness. To maximize your antibody penetration, stain free floating sections. Use detergents like uh, Triton X you may need to increase your concentration higher than what you've done for thinner cut sections, right? So, you, Or you can increase Triton X in more of your wash cycles. So you can put it in with your washes, you can put it in with your primary and so on. Um, and don't forget the time and temperature play a role too. So when, when you're looking at your protocol, all of these things matter. This tissue as an example, this is new end stain tissue and uh, bright field, and it was cut at 30 microns. And you can see that the antibody penetrates uh, wonderfully through this tissue. And so this is an XZ projection. And what you can see is that you can distinguish cell tops all the way through the tissue. Um, this tissue had very minimal shrinkage too. This, this te um, technique was uh, very optimized beautifully. Um, the amount of shrinkage was very minimal. On average, these sections were between 24 and 25 microns thick. So that was very impressive. It's also possible and 
potentially easier to get full antibody penetration with fluorescent specimens or fluorescent stain specimens, again, using free floating as your um, choice for how you stain the tissue. And you can see here that when you have full antibody penetrance, you can see a lot of detail in that XZ uh, projection. Um, one thing that I just want to mention is that I want to go to Stereo Investigator and show you how to actually create these XZ projections so that you know how to evaluate this. And Hamza has anticipated this and wants to know how to do it. So I'm happy to oblige. So you have your stack loaded into Stereo Investigator. And this has to be a stack. So even if you have um, bright field tissue where you're not necessarily capturing when you're counting, in order to assess antibody penetrance, you need to capture a stack because we're going to select um, the 3D visualization window under the image tab. We want to display the entire image volume. And so here's the XY view. But what we need to do is look at the XZ. And so you select the bottom view or XZ button. And now you can zoom in as you'd like. And you can start to assess whether or not you have um, a dead zone that needs to be further uh, mitigated. I hope that's helpful. OK, well, let's take another question here. Actually, you know what? Let's uh, let's switch gears. There's a couple of questions here about non-thick section probes. So why don't we uh, look at that real quick? There are a ton of questions. You guys are doing a great job. Please keep sending them in. This is great. There is a question about the physical fractionator. So the rules for the physical fractionator are different. The input is different for physical fractionator probe than for the optical fractionator. The optical fractionator uses thick tissue where the optical planes are continuously aligned for the dissector, whereas the physical fractionator uses um, two separate physical sections, and then you compare those two physical sections to identify the objects of interest. And so if you're planning to quantify using the physical um, fractionator, the question is, what's the most efficient way to orient paired sections on the slide to keep the reference and counting sites aligned? If you're using Stereo Investigator, we have tools to make this orientation and alignment straightforward and easy. But there are a couple things that you can do to make it easier on yourself. So what I would recommend is that um, when you collect your sections as a ribbon, mount them as a ribbon. So that means even if you are going to count um, this red section and the green section, instead of only mount, you know, separating them from the ribbon and then hand mounting each of those, if it's feasible, mount the ribbon. And then what you'll do is you'll just need to keep track of which section pair is the reference and the lookup. To aid in the alignment steps, you can choose a fiducial region after looking at your sections. So you can see here that in order for alignment, you need to choose a fiducial um, area so that you can rotate and change the transparency in order to do some counting. And so that would mean then that you need that fiducial to be as consistent as possible. So if we were to look at um, the center region here on these two sections, the red one and the green one, you can see that this looks like a highly unique or uh, explicit area that might make a good fiducial. But by the time you look at your lookup section, it's no longer there. And so instead, it can help you with the alignment if you choose your fiducial carefully. So take a look at both sections before you decide what how you're going to align. It may just make things a little bit easier before you get started. And so one way you can do that is to acquire a 2D virtual slice of your sections on the slide before you start your process of doing the physical fractionator so that you can easily zoom in and out of each section that you're going to quantify to get a good look at them. OK, while we're at it, 
there's another question about thin tissue. And the question is, do you have any protocol tips for immunohistochemistry staining plastic glycol methacrylate embedded tissue? Uh, I don't myself have a tremendous amount of experience. The plastic sectioning that I did um, in graduate school, I, I stained with tellurium blue, actually. Um, so I didn't have an issue with them. I didn't do immunohistochemistry. However, there's a Cold Spring Harbor protocol that, that might be helpful. Um, Makeva um, and colleagues um, have a protocol for doing a ray tomography. And in that case, they're using um, LR white uh, as the embedding medium. But they're doing uh, immunofluorescence, immunohistochemistry staining on these um, ultra thin sections. And so maybe there, this is a very detailed protocol. There might have some, some tips that you can apply to your particular application. One last thing before I switch. We covered how thick is thick when it comes to thick sections. Um, let me just touch on how thin is thin when we're talking about thin sections. If you're doing the physical fractionator, you want to cut as thinly as possible with the idea being that the object of interest has the opportunity to be in the, the reference and the lookup because you're going to count the situations when it appears in one and not the other. And so if you can cut two micron thick sections, that's great. If you can cut four micron sections, that'll be great too. Um, you're going to have, as the section thickness gets thicker, you're going to have more uh, challenges when it comes to alignment because things are going to change more dramatically between those sections. So thinner um, is really helpful when you're doing the physical fractionator. And if you want to go really thin and do array tomography, then you're going to be cutting at 70 nanometers, which is really pretty cool. So along this whole concept of, of what thick versus thin, we can address this question. I'm interested in learning how, if at all, this can be applied to paraffin sections. Even if this cannot be addressed, I think it would still be hugely beneficial to me and our lab. Well, I, ho I hope this is helpful. So when you're doing the physical fractionator, you can certainly use paraffin sections, provided you're cutting nice and thin. We skipped from plastic right to um, nice, thick, uh, frozen sections, and we rarely address paraffin. Paraffin's sweet spot is actually right between the two. You know, a typical section thickness cut for paraffin is 8 to 12. And, and unfortunately, that's not uh, appropriate for most thick section probes. I would say all of them because you don't have enough optical planes through that 8 microns to see um, when cells first come into focus as well as... Um, distinguish them from, from their neighbors. And so paraffin staining is, is a well-utilized technique in many labs, for sure. Uh, you can use paraffin staining for any of the 2D probes. So physical fractionator is one if you're interested in number. You can use uh, Cavalieri if you're interested in area or volume, as well as the area fraction fractionator um, in order to do that. So I hope that helps. In most cases, if you're interested in number, it is more efficient to optimize your histology so that you can apply the optical fractionator than to cut thin the way that you are or even thinner and do the physical fractionator. It's generally less work to do the optical fractionator. Okay, let me grab a new, new question. So if my section thickness is less than the recommended one, is that okay to continue counting? There's two parts to this question, I believe. Um, the first is, what is your average and minimum section thickness? If it's too thin, you're going to be sacrificing not just efficiency, but also accuracy if you're trying to apply the optical fractionator on too thin tissue. And then the second question, so let's say you do have... Um, appropriately thick tissue, say it's 18 microns on average, that's great. But you come across an animal that has a much, you know, appeared to exhibit 
more shrinkage than the animal that you de determined your sampling parameters with. So your dye sector height is no longer wholly contained within your section thickness on this thin, thinly sectioned animal. In that situation, you need to stop counting and change your parameters so that the dye sector height is wholly contained within your um, section thickness. An occasional too thin is okay, but at MBF Labs, we reevaluate sampling parameters if we get more than four too thin warnings because we want to make sure that we're not introducing um, an unnecessary amount of error that we can just fix by changing the dye sector height. If you change the dye sector height, you have to change that dye sector height for all of the probes for that population in that animal. So if you've got a thin section, um, but all the rest of them are thick, that's unfortunate, but you have to make the sampling parameters consistent across all sections. So it's good to optimize your histology to minimize the variability and to maximize the thickness and staining penetration. Okay. All right, so um, let, me, let me answer this question. This is interesting. Um, and gets right to this concept of, uh, you know, what, what sampling parameters are and how you can use them. And so this question is, we collected brain sections at 40 microns for most animals, but accidentally cut one brain at 25 microns. If this brain of 25 microns can be used for stereology, how do I make an adjustment during imaging and quantification? So in this hypothetical situation, for me, if you have that brain that was cut at 25 micron sections and the post-processing section thickness is reasonable for the optical fractionator probe, so again, 18 to 20 microns post-processing section thickness, then what you can do is optimize your sampling parameters for this particular animal. There is no requirement that every animal be counted with the same parameters. It's just more efficient to do it that way in many cases. But you can optimize your sampling parameters for each animal if you'd like, and this would be a good case for that. So if you're cutting at 25 microns instead of 40 and you stained every fourth section, you're going to have many more sections in this 25 micron section brain than, than its cohort, the remaining cohort. So you may not need to evaluate with the same interval as well as the same um, dye sector height. And so in that case, it, it may be possible that the area sampling fraction wouldn't change, but you can optimize these for an individual animal. Just achieve an acceptable CE. So the question is, was that for each section or each animal you had to change your dye sector height? Do not change your dye sector height per section. That's inappropriate. Each object must have an equal likelihood of being sampled once and only once. And so you... Um, in an individual animal for a population, you must use the same parameters all the way through every section that you look at. So if you need to change your dye sector height because you have constitutively two thin sections um, compared to your, your standard parameter set, you need to make sure that every section for that subject were counted with this modified dye sector height. Okay, so how do you decide on the dye sector height? Barbara follows up that question with, well, what do you do with the dye sector height? This is a little bit outside um, a histology Q&A, but it fits in pretty nicely, I think. So let me find an appropriate slide here that I can use. So in, in both of these um, graphs, these are... Uh, MBF Labs pilot study animals. And so this is how we do a pilot study. When we do a pilot study, we uh, determine sampling parameters by counting first with a dye sector height equal to the section cut thickness and a guard zone of zero. And so what we're doing is we're actually plotting the cell tops through the entire section thickness for the animals in the pilot study. And so what you can do then is you get this great graph that shows you not only how uniform and thick your section thickness is, but also how to determine your dissector height and guard zones. 
So we use this to look at the distribution of objects through your section thickness. This peak here at the top of the section, I believe that's due to tissue collapse once you've mounted the sections because you, you tend to let the sections dry a little bit. So you get a little bit of collapse at the top, but in general, um, the section is, is pretty uniformly um, maintained. And so you're going to have this normal distribution of objects being found throughout the section thickness. That's expected. And so we set the guard zone to um, trim off these big peaks because depending on how you add them in, you could skew your results. Um, so we choose the dissector height from that. So if we need a 2 micron guard zone and our minimum section thickness is on average 18 microns, then a 2 micron top guard zone is, uh, and a 2 micron bottom guard zone is 4 microns, and so that leaves me with a 14 micron dissector. And so in a nutshell, that's how you determine the dissector height. And you can see that you can even use this, this process on an individual animal basis because this animal here, animal 21, it's already too thin to, to handle 18 microns for the dissector and guard zones. So I would choose a different dissector height in that case. Okay, so, but back on to histology. It is a good question because you need to apply what you've seen in the tissue in order to then move on to, to counting. Joseph has a question. I can address. So what's the best way to count fluorescent stained tissue to minimize fading? So if you are going to do um, uh, fluorescent stereology, how do you minimize um, the fading? Well, first you can add um, an anti-fade agent to your mounting media, like Prolong. There's a whole series of those. I'm sure you're familiar with them. I would first recommend that. VectaShield has fluorescence fading protection as well. And then in addition, you can either, when it comes time to count, you can do two options. You can acquire image stacks in an SRS fashion. Uh, using Stereo Investigator, we can set it up so that you acquire all of your image data at once, and then you return to that image data to count it. And the benefit of that is that you're acquiring the image data at the time when it is it's fresh. It's going to be the brightest. It's going to be the cleanest. Um, you're going to have less autofluorescence and, and any of that material that may happen. The downside of that is that it can take a little bit of time. An additional benefit to it, not to complicate things too much, but you, if you have image stacks, it's straightforward to count uh, multi-labeled populations, which is an extreme benefit of using um, fluorescent stereology. So what we do at MBF Labs is we tend to count live, but we have acquired stacks as well. Your best way to combat fading is to, to be quick about your counting. So you should size your dissector, your counting frame, so that it fits zero to five objects through, through the entire height of your section thickness so that you can visit each counting site quickly. And if you have some practice, you will be able to speed through your data collection. And so you can do it live. If you are counting a double labeled population, it may make more sense to acquire those images on the fly so that you can see each object on the basis of that double labeled population. So I hope that helps with your, um, with your question. A follow-on to that is, well, what if one of the fluorescent secondaries fades during acquisition? What we're seeing is 48 exposure being oversaturated in the first image of the stack. Do we need to expose tissue at all stack collection points prior to image acquisition? What I would say is that it's interesting to me that you're having this, this fast peak and then a, a die-off of the 488 label. and if you do need to expose the tissue at all stack collection points, you actually could do that during the SRS image stack acquire workflow. Because what you can do is you can set up a, a pre-focus operation where you have the 488 filter in place and you go to each site and set the top. And at that point you could um, allow that to bring your 
your oversaturation to the proper level, if if that would work for you. And then and then um, at the next step, you would the software automatically returns to each of those sites to capture the stack. So that might be one way to address that issue, but I'm sure there's a few other ways as well. So to review, we want to look at the whole anatomic region. And so we're going to be looking at a number of sections through your region of interest systematically through your um, entire region. And what happens if you lose a section containing your region of interest? What, what should you do? Should you tell the program that there was a section and then make no tracing on it? And how, sh how will this be interpreted by the software? There's a few common histological processing issues that impact stereology. So even once you've optimized your histology, you can still have damage. Uh, you can have a tear through your region of interest. You can have a fold that obscures your region of interest um, at particular counting sites. Or you can have a section that's lost or damaged during processing. So for folds and tears, you, you count as usual. You skip those dissectors that have uncountable areas. Um, meaning by skipping, you're not going to find an object to be that meets the criteria to be counted. So it's OK to have a zero dissector. That's always the case. But what do you do with missing sections? So when you have damage like this, where if you're counting the dentate gyrus, you're going to have a hard time expecting that the estimate that you would get from this, this section represents what it had been like if there had been no damage. So first, let's cover the strategies to minimize loss. You should use a sharp knife when you're doing your sectioning. Clean it often so that you don't get any gunk on the blade that then tears through your sections as you're cutting. You can do free-floating immunohistochemistry. You're touching the sections less, and they're not being exposed to air um, as much or as often, so um, they're not going to shrink as much either. And when it comes time to mount the sections, if you are having the situation where sections are falling off, you can try using positively charged slides if you aren't already. And then handle the slides and sections carefully during washes and mounting. That goes without saying, but um, a gentle hand it, uh, can pay dividends. And so this question of how many sections are OK, the, the best is obviously zero. And then the next best is one. And then after that, your mileage may vary. I want to just discuss the options that you have when you have missing sections. Um, there are a few different strategies that you can use. You can choose a different random series of sections to stain. So if you are collecting your sections into cups or into that multi-well plate, and you knock over a cup and lose some sections at that point, it might make more sense to start over. So choose another random series of sections and stain them. It, it, it pains me to say that, but <laughs> it may actually be the best option in the long run. If that's not acceptable, you can choose to substitute an adjacent uncounted section. This is by far the best option for you if you have a missing section and you can't go back to the drawing board and start over. Um, while you're starting out, like if you're just getting started in this whole stereology process, you can plan for terrible events to occur, which I hope don't, but just in case. So what I mean by this is Let's say you've done the math and you know that you need a 1 in 8 series through the striatum in order to um, uh, obtain the estimate of neuron number that you're interested in. If you're afraid of missing sections or lo loss of sections, um, maybe instead of staining a 1 in 8 series, you stain in 1 in 4 so that you have uh, the option to substitute an adjacent section if, if you don't if you have loss or in the in the situation of you need more um, precision for your estimate this option is 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 a great one and I highly recommend it um, uh, strategy number three may work for you it depends on your experimental design but uh, if you're counting ipsilaterally maybe you can count the contralateral side in that particular section that's damaged and then 
Assuming that that's not possible and two, option one and two also aren't possible, you can mathematically estimate what the section's contribution to the estimate would be. And in this case, there are two ways to do that. You can use account for missing section in Stereo Investigator, or you can take the number of markers on the contralateral side and flanking ipsilateral sections and apply. Any of these methods, except for option number one, is going to add an unknown amount of error to your estimate. Um, so you need to be aware of that. Um, so indicate how you're going to account for missing sections in the method section and in your data file so you've got a nice little record of what you did and why you, why you did it. Okay, so missing sections. Let's bring that back. So you've done everything you can. You've still lost a section. That, it happens. So how do you deal with it programmatically in the software? So I mentioned just to here, before I do that, let me just review those options again. Okay. So the missing sections, you can start over with a different series of sections from that brain. You can substitute an adjacent section. That's an excellent option uh, if you have that available to you. And then if you don't have that available to you, you can mathematically estimate what the contribution to the estimate would have been. And again, you're estimating. So again, you're going to add some amount of error to um, the total population estimate. We just don't know how, by how much because we don't know how many cells were actually in that section that ended up lost, torn, or eaten by vultures. Who knows? So in Stereo Investigator, there are two ways to do it. We'll start with the easy. And by easy, I mean the software programmers here at MVF wrote uh, some fabulous code to help you deal with this situation. And then I'll show you how to do it manually. Um, in situations, for situations where it just doesn't work that way. Okay. So I've loaded a data file. And you account for missing sections after you're done um, counting the entire animal. Don't do it midway. It, it doesn't help. So do it after the fact. So after you've completed your entire study or all the sections for that particular animal. And so here's my data. And I'm going to start the program again. Okay, so I'm going to bring up my data file. And now, there we go, that's much better. So you can see that I'm on each section here, and I've got data in every section except for this one, 17. This one was the damage beyond repair section. So it's just not reasonable to count it. What should we do about that? Using the software method, you can account for missing section by um, selecting it from the probes menu. So in order to start and select this option, you have to have a um, section in the serial section manager that is your placeholder for that missing section. You can do account for missing section for three probes, the fractionator, optical fractionator, and Cavalieri. Uh, you can choose the optical fractionator in this case. You select the, the section that's missing, and you select OK. Now when we look at the data, you can see that right off the bat, the first, first probe, instead of having a contour name, just says missing section. Okay. And so now, if we select that, as well as all of the other probe runs that are relevant for that particular population estimate, in this case, we're interested in the bilateral striatum, so left and right, we'll view the results. And when you look at the data, you'll see that not only do you get your population estimate for mean section thickness, only with uh, sites with counts, or using number weighted, you also get an estimate calculated by adjusting for that missing section fraction. And so in this case, this is what you would choose, whichever of these three or four estimates that are available to you, the one that's most relevant. And so you might choose number weighted section thickness. And so in that case, the number you would report is 821,125, this one right here. It's as simple as that. So where did this number come from? So this number here 
uh, came from all the markers that were placed in all of the sections that had data. And then those sections were actually averaged to come up with the average marker count per section. And that value was included as this mi missing section value um, for your sum of Q minus um, part of the equation. OK? All right, so that's, that's the simple case. You've lost the whole, whole section. Um, how do you deal with that? Now let me show you um, what you do for a more complicated situation where you only have unilateral damage. Let me delete that. That's what we're going to do. I'm going to show you how to do it um, right now. Okay. So in this, in this case, we have data in all the sections. We have data in every section, but we don't have a contour for the right side here. It's missing. And so we need to we don't need to replace the entire section with an estimate. We just need to replace you know, this one contour. And so we got to figure out how to do that. So the way that you can do that is you examine the data that you do have. And so the first option is to look at the contralateral side and determine how many markers were placed. In this case, this was 63. So 63 markers were placed on this particular section for the left um, CP. You can compare that to the uh, right CP, um, the flanking section, so slide 16 and slide 18 here. And we don't care about the interval here, because all we're interested in is the marker count. So the total number of markers was 58. If you divide that by 2, you get, what, 26? No, 29. Sorry. I haven't had lunch yet. So. Um, so you need to determine what makes more sense. Do you, is it more appropriate to take the average of the flanking sections? Maybe it's appropriate to take the, the average of the entire right side. So it would be akin to doing a count for missing section for the right side only. Or perhaps it makes the most anatomical sense to um, represent the right side with the same number of markers as the left side. And so. Whichever is appropriate, you deem appropriate. Here's how you go about adding in that value to your estimate. So first, you need to draw a contour. I highly recommend you make something not biologically um, relevant. So draw something that clearly indicates that you did it and it wasn't anatomically correct. Once you have your contour, you start the optical fractionator workflow. You can do this on your desktop version. You don't have to do this at the microscope. And it'll load up section 17 here. And you can see that there is a probe run for the left side, but there isn't one for the right side yet. So this is the one we need to add data to. You need to use the appropriate sampling parameters and start the probe. And we're not actually going to measure anything. That's irrelevant for this particular exercise here. And so once you have a, a dissector, I like to zoom out and select a marker. OK, and I just drew something, actually. So I made a smiley face that is consisted of 29 markers. because. I decided that um, taking the average of the 16 and 18 seemed to be a more appropriate representation of what 17 might have looked like than taking the contralateral side. Um, then you can change that trace marker to the correct marker. Um, this is a handy way to do it so that you don't have to keep track of how many markers you've placed. And then once you've done that, you can end the, the workflow here and look at your data. So now 
we don't have a missing section that pops up here. Instead, what we have is we have a manually drawn contour that is now part of our estimate. So you select all of the contours now and view your results. This is when the interval does matter because you're interested in the, in the estimate. And so now you can get your three estimates here. But notice it doesn't say adjusted for missing sections. It's because Stereo Investigator has no concept that it might be missing. Um, that's why I especially like to make sure that the data is represented in a really obvious way. So that when I come back to this data file weeks or months later, I know what happened and how I dealt with it. And so the other thing I like to do is indicate um, Uh, um, of how, how I came up with this number of 29 markers so that I have a record of it. So I hope that, that this is helpful to you, and, um, and I hope it's a situation you don't encounter very often. Uh, Austin asks, is there any way to remove capillaries from tissue other than hydrogen peroxide? So uh, blood vessels stain very, very well. You, your only option that I'm aware of is to quench that with hydrogen peroxide. I don't know of another way, uh, unfortunately. It can make things a bit more complicated. Oh, Hamza has a suggestion for the hydrogen peroxide, the capillary issue. Hamza suggests that um, uh, when you during your perfusion step, uh, perfuse with PBS, not just saline. You might give that a try, see if that helps. There's a question here about whether the missing section option is available in the old systems as well. The answer is yes. So um, you don't need the latest and greatest version 11, although I highly recommend it. Uh, you should have that same option in previous versions of the software. One last question about um, staining. So for immunofluorescence, we use an overnight incubation for primary, but only two hours for secondary, and we have some penetration issues. Would it be helpful if we increase the secondary incubation time? That's certainly one thing that you can look at. You can also look to see, I'm assuming you're doing your two hours at room temperature, uh, but if you are doing it at four degrees, you might just try put doing it on the bench top. In this case, when you're when you're adjusting the secondary incubation, you got to be concerned about um, increasing your background above acceptable levels. Remember, though, that for stereology, it doesn't need to be stunningly gorgeous. It just needs to be uh, clear so that you can tell when an object comes into focus for the very first time, um, and whether or not you should include it in your estimate. So it can be kind of muddy with some some background so long as you can still distinguish what's positively labeled in a very unified way. In summary, you need to prepare your tissue so that all positions in your structure have the same likelihood of being sampled. I think free-floating immunohistochemistry is really the way to go for uh, frozen sections because you're not changing so much of every step of your protocol as just switching to a new way of staining that allows the antibody to penetrate both surfaces of the section, both the top and the bottom of the section. And it can help mitigate tissue shrinkage because you're not constantly having the opportunity for those sections to be exposed to air as you're switching um, solutions. Optimizing your histology can obviously improve your accuracy and the efficiency of any stereologic probe that you're going to do. Because uh, remember, if you can't see it, you can't count it. And so we need to make sure that that's a possibility, or an actuality, not a possibility. And it's an art. Histology is an art. So there are many paths that you can use to reach the same destination. So the things that I've suggested are suggestions. I hope that they're helpful, but it doesn't mean that that's the only way to get antibody penetration all the way through your section thickness is by increasing your trait next to 1% instead of 0.3. There's a myriad of ways that you can do it. What I'm hopeful that our conversation today was is just increase some, uh, give you more options, more things to consider, more things to try. If you'd like to learn more about stereology, you can go to www.stereology.info. This has a lot of information about individual probes and how to um, conceptually think about them. 
our next webinar, we're going to have a guest. Dr. Mark West is going to join me, and we're going to cover the topic of bias, um, which should be really interesting. So I hope that you'll join us for that. We have many other practical demonstration webinars as well as theory webinars on our website. Please take a look if there's something there that you would like. Please uh, let us know what you think about the webinar and what we can do um, to make them better in the future. So use those uh, questions when you leave that, the GoToWebinar session to give us some feedback. That would be great. And um, if you'd like a free trial of Stereo Investigator or you have follow-up questions, just send us an email or give us a call. We're happy to help. Okay, so thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate it. I hope the webinar gave you some helpful tips. Have a great day, and uh, I'll see you next time.